Hey, welcome to Life in the Leadership Lane. I'm your host, Bruce Waller, where I get to talk to leaders that are making a difference in the workplace and in our community. What did they do to get started and what do they do to continue to stay there, stay driving in that leadership lane? And today I am so excited. I have a very special guest. His name is Steve Brown. He's a vice president of human resources for La Rosa's Pizzeria. He is an author of two great books, HR on Purpose and his newest book, HR Rising, which we're going to talk a lot about today. He's a speaker. He's a Sherm board member, a volunteer leader, founder of HR Net Community, and so much more. And I'm so glad to have you on the show, Steve. Great to be here, Bruce. I always love talking to you, my friend. Hey, do you remember, I, I was just thinking back uh, as I was reflecting on uh, our, our interview today. Do you remember the first time we met back in 2011? I was with uh, Carlos and we were at the volunteer leaders meeting. I think it was VLRC at the time. It's, it's changed the name since. Yeah, and we met things. you and you were at, it was a bar after, you know, after the event, it was a networking event. And uh, do you remember that time? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That was our favorite haunt, uh, Irish bar. And uh, yes. it, it's unfortunately uh, closed up shop. Uh, they, the rent, they raised the rent during the pandemic, so they just closed it. But yeah, that was our favorite haunt. We, we pulled everybody there that we could. You know, um, I, I remember that moment. It's, it's interesting how we remember those moments because I didn't really know anyone. I was the upcoming president for Dallas HR. I was just learning the ropes. And uh, you just made, I just remember you just making me feel like welcoming. And so that, that was so cool. Hey, we're going to talk about your newest book, HR Rising, today. We're going to talk leadership. We're going to talk uh, about some really, really cool stuff. But before we get started, I would love for you to share just a, a highlight of La Rosa's Pizzeria and, and how you serve your customers. Oh, great question. We're different than a lot of places. Uh, we've been in business 65 years, and we're kind of an institution, an iconic brand here in the greater Cincinnati area. It's a family pizzeria, and it very, very much is a family pizzeria. We have constant examples of people celebrating showers or weddings or uh, funerals and celebrating the life of a loved one. Uh, when it first started, Mr. La Rosa had people come there before prom. Uh, people have been engaged in our uh, place. It's just a different feel. It is a full-service Italian restaurant where we have uh, dine-in, carry-out, pickup, delivery, and curbside pickup now with the pandemic. Uh, but it is the kind of place where if you grew up in the Cincinnati area and they say, where do you eat pizza? They say La Rosa's. And it's not that they don't eat others, but we have guests that eat three to four times a week at our place. And it's just a great place. We have incredible tenure uh, compared to a lot of other restaurant chains. Uh, for example, yesterday, we celebrated a person's 20th anniversary who works in our bakery and she oversees the stretching of dough. And she's worked there for 20 years. Uh, and when I get off the call here, we're gonna celebrate somebody who's worked in our call center for 35 years. So it's just unheard of in this day and age, but it's the kind of place when people work here, Bruce, honest to goodness, you say, tell me what, what you wanna say about La Rosa's and they go, oh, I love it here. And you could feel it in their voice. It's the best place ever. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, man, the dough stretcher. I love that. And I love how you, and I've read a lot uh, over, uh, especially in your, in your books, about how you do a great job recognizing uh, your, your team members. And so I absolutely love that. You know, before we get into your book and, and uh, into some, uh, some leadership, I would love for uh, the listeners and the viewers to learn a little bit more about you, Steve. Can you share, like, where did you grow up? And how in the world did you get into HR? I grew up in Northwest Ohio in a small town of about 5,000 called Ada, Ohio. It's most known for the university that's there, Ohio, North, Ohio Northern University. And uh, it is the home of the NFL football. Hmm. So all NFL footballs are made in a small place. Every year on the Super Bowl, they go, Ada, Ohio. I'm like, yeah, to us, it's normal. Everybody else is like, what in the world is this? Uh, and it was 
to put it mildly, like growing up in Mayberry, I was just back visiting uh, my mom, who's still there, and the a person brought flowers because my mom just had surgery. She's all good. She had hip replacement surgery, but the florist brought some flowers there, and she says, "How how is Connie doing? And how did her surgery go?" And she's the florist, mm. and that's normal. So that's the kind of environment I grew up in. So everybody knew everybody for generations, and it was very close knit. Uh, a little too sheltered, to be honest. You know, it's a small town, uh, but it was great. I loved working there. Loved living there. And um, but it was nice to break out. And as for how I got into HR, oh, <laughs> uh, I was failing in college. I was going in to be an engineer and then a chemist. And I was failing. And what I didn't realize was I was in the wrong area because my mom, who's very astute, said, don't you realize that you're always around people? Why aren't you in a field that's involved with people? And I went, oh, well, okay. Mm -hmm. So back then there wasn't HR. It was labor relations or personnel. And so I picked a recruiting job because I was in an interviewing class. And in the interviewing class, I was, they, at the end of the class, they said, who should interview who and why? And the class chose that I should interview myself. And I took that as a sign. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, so I thought, well, I'll try this out, went into recruiting. And so it's funny, a lot of people say they fall into HR or it was an accident. I chose. I chose from the very moment I came out of college. And now this will be my, oh, goodness, 35th, 36th year in HR. It's the best profession there is. You know, I can't get enough of it. Yeah, it's fantastic. One thing I, I really appreciate and value about you, Steve, is that how you advocate uh, HR, the HR community, leadership, serving HR. And so, you know, uh, one of the things I like to also uh, ask guests is, uh, about the people that have like helped us get to where we are. And we call them many times, we'll call them mentors. Uh, David Winley on the show called it sponsors as well. And I would, I would love for you if you could just share, like I'm thinking like your mom gave you incredible advice. What a great mentor. Can you share a few mentors that have helped you uh, in your career? Absolutely. I, I can think of three distinctly. Uh, well, one was Norm Poe. I love Norm. Norm worked in a family business and we were in a manufacturing company together. And Norm was the non-family member who was the president of the organization. Mm. And he saw, saw the value in taking care of people. He grew up taking care of the people on the floor. And he says, this is what I want from my HR person. Now the person I replaced, Herb, was very traditional personnel and he could kill it. He had file cabinets of file cabinets of file cabinets of paper. <laughs> and that was his job. And Norm said, I don't think this is working. I need you to do this. So this was before the whole seat at the table stuff. Every day, Norm and I had conversations every day. And I was there for him. I was there to, be, to learn from him. But he was also someone who poured into me to say, here's some things I need you to work on. Here's how I want to hear about the men because the men won't talk to me. I need to hear from them though. Can you help me with this? Mm -hmm. And so we worked constantly together, a fantastic guy. And then after I left that, I went to an engineering company and my boss there was Kathy Coleman. Kathy was a self-made person, a female in a professional services organization that was architecture and engineering. So someone who's already running against the norm. So she didn't have that technical background, that STEM background, but without her, the company didn't exist. She ran it all. She was the culture, she did all of the admin side of things, and she moved the company forward. And she taught me how to work autonomously. Mm. So she was, I'm not going to manage you every day. I need you to take care of yourself, but here's what I expect from you. So she modeled accountability better than anybody had ever seen before. And I was allowed to explore and be creative and be more tied to the people at the organization. And we became the great people organization she wanted it to be because she allowed me the latitude to do it. And she also encouraged me to get involved outside of the company because she said, we're too small. We don't have the resources to teach you everything inside. You need to get out and find out what's going on around you. So she opened the door to 
where what I didn't know would lead to where I'm at today of, hey, you need to uh, really get out there. And then the last one is Kevin. And if I get emotional, you just need to hang with me here. Uh, Kevin Burrow, who is my boss, who unfortunately passed away here. And Kevin and I here at La Rosa's, I've been with Kevin for 14 years every day. Kevin modeled everything that I get to write about or live. Uh, he was the guy who went and said hi to everybody. He's the person who said, so Bruce, tell me how the kids are doing. Tell me how your dog's mm -hmm. doing. And the next day, day, he'd come and go, hey, you told me your dog had surgery. How'd that go? Mm -hmm. And he'd know it just knowing it. And I've always tried to be that person, but I never really worked for somebody. Kathy did that a bit. Norm did that a bit. But Kevin lived it. Mm. And he what, has an operations background. He was with us for 45 years in the company. Typical, La Rosa's employee. And then he, but he taught me the value of really acknowledging people. Who His favorite term to me was acknowledgement is the best form of recognition. Oh, so man. thank thank the cook who comes in and works when you don't have to. Thank the person who stretches dough who comes in at four in the morning when you're in bed. Thank the maintenance person who's working on an oven uh, just so we can make sure we're serving pizza to people. He just lived it every day. And uh, now that he's gone, uh, I've learned how much he was individually pouring into me daily. Uh, he, the other thing he taught me, which I really feel works is development is a daily interaction mm. versus development's a program development's a course development's a conference those are great things but those are like mountaintop experiences or events his was every day you have a chance to develop somebody so make sure every interaction you have develops somebody and so amazing what a, <clears throat> what a beautiful legacy um and, and to be surrounded by these great people um, and, and that's what we talk about. And that's what I hope that, you know, life in the leadership lane will also help with is, is help people look to see, hey, am I doing the things I, you know, the right way? Or do I do I want to shift because there's great opportunity to model leadership. Um, folks, if you're listening to this right now, I'm just going to tell you, hit that pause button, get that ink pen out, get that journal out, because there's going to be some gold. I mean, um, acknowledgement is uh, best for recognition and then a development daily. Uh, oh my gosh, that is absolutely fantastic, Steve. I appreciate you sharing that. Let me, uh, let me ask you, I mean, let's talk leadership here. Um, you, you talk a lot about leadership uh, in the HR community. Uh, as a leader, I always like to say we need to think of business leadership first serving HR versus, hey, we're HR. Sure. And you talk a lot about leadership. Let, let me ask you this. What, what, is, what does leadership mean to you? I use the model that I read in uh, Rick Warren's, and I know this is going down the faith route, but that's who I am. Uh, he wrote in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, if you're a leader, turn around and look over your shoulder. If no one's following you, you're not a leader. And I went, oh my gosh, that is powerful stuff. And, and here's my thing. I don't feel leadership is self-proclaimed. Mm. I don't think people who hold titles are leaders. I don't think people who have tenure have leaders. I don't think people who are senior roles have leaders. Leadership is expressed because of your behavior mm. and how you treat others. The first thing for me is a leader must be others focused, period. Mm. They great leaders will know that their worth will be shown in how they invest in others. It's not invest in me first, invest in me first. It's really take care of others, genuinely take care of others. Uh, other, but to do that, you have to take interest in who they are and what they do. Not, you need to be like this, Bruce, or I'm going to shape you and be like this. No, it's who are you? Tell me more who you are. It's funny when I hear people struggle with the issue of diversity we make it so much more than it is. We are different. Let's value what that difference is and let's accentuate that difference because it's your strength. And you can put any form of diversity in that bucket and you'll be much more comfortable because you're facing it from a factual place versus a category place. And uh, the other part is you gotta have fun. Doggone mm. it. There are some sour, sour people. <laughs> I, I saw 
<laughs> I saw, did you see the lawyers on yesterday? And the one yeah, guy had the, the, the cat. cat. Oh and it went viral and people went crazy. We're like, cats, cats, cats. I heard people today going, wow, that was stupid. What, that's how non-professional. I'm like, that is the best thing ever. And it tells you how much is missing. Just enjoying what we do and enjoying the people around us. Uh, it's easy to be critical. Doggone it, it's easy. Too, too easy. But it's more difficult to be positive and encouraging. Mm. Leaders, to me, are positive and encouraging. They meet you where you are, mm. and they lift you up. Mm. And they don't lift you up to blow smoke or jack you up or just try to manipulate you. Sorry, manipulate you. They, they do it to say, I believe in you, Bruce, and I need you to move ahead, and this is how. Mm. So, you know, Kevin's example of uh, truly, truly taking an interest in your personal life, not just words, but truly taking an interest. And everybody felt they felt valued within every time. Leaders make other people feel valued. They just do. Mm, so good. So, man, there is so much there. Uh, I, listen, I, w- I want to I dive in because you talk a lot about leadership. You talk about the, the, uh, a lot about um, others first uh, and, and, you know, things to focus on. I love the fun part. I love how you shared that. So important. By the way, I saw that our mutual friend, uh, Jennifer McClure had shared that on Twitter and I just, I saw that and I watched it and I watched it and I watched it and like 10 <laughs> times later, I'm like, Hey, and I told my wife, you gotta watch this. We laughed at that thing for 20 minutes. It was oh, yeah. so funny. Um, I want to, I want to ask you, so I'm, listen, if you're listening, you, you can't see this, but I'm holding up a couple of books. The first book is called HR on purpose. Steve Brown published this in 2000. 17. I got my personalized autograph copy here. I just love that. I, w- I want to just share three things real quick uh, that I loved about that book. Uh, one of the things uh, was about the 30-day challenge mm-hmm. and uh, the uh, your boss challenging you to learn everyone's names. I'll, I'll let you hit on that. And then the other thing was the bowling guy. I'm, of course, me, my parents own bowling center. So when that bowling story was in there, I immediately like, Tom, that's my guy. And the <laughs> way you were able to connect with him was absolutely uh, amazing. Talk a little bit about, uh, first of all, I, w- I would love to hear um, if you want to touch on either one of those stories. And then you wrote HR on purpose. And then why did you decide to write HR Rising? And, th- and then I want to get into that. Okay. Uh, I think both stories talk about the importance of being intentional with people. Mm -hmm. Too many people in organizations don't feel that they're even seen or recognized or acknowledged. And I know we've used those words earlier, but but here's what's key. You can have someone come to work, be well-known and be the most loneliest person in the world because no one's truly connecting with them. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to connect with somebody is intentionally knowing their name. And so every time I see you, I say, Hey, Bruce, or hey, Susie, or hey, Julie, not hey, you, well, hey, and, we, and we're so foolish about this. We get so embarrassed, and we get inside our head and go, I forgot that person's name, and what am I going to do? If people, HR people especially, we go, hey, I'm sorry, I forgot who you are. Mm. I don't want to do that anymore. Tell me your name. When mm. I go into pizzerias now, and we have 1,100 team members, and I honestly have never met them all, and probably never will, because they work different shifts and all kinds of things or part-time schedules, and we wear name tags, and I still ask a person's name, even though they're wearing the name tag, because when I walk in, I want to know, I met Diamond, who's a new host at one of our pizzerias last night, because she says, how many people to come in? She's doing her job. I said, I'm not going to let you seat me at all, and she went, what's going on? And <laughs> It threw her off base and said, I don't dress. I don't have the La Rosa gear on. Anyway, she doesn't know who I am. I said, hi, I'm Steve. I'm from the office. And she went, oh, no. I went, no, no, it's cool. And then the manager was like, oh, no, we like Steve. He's great. And what's funny is then I could go around and go, hey, Justin, hey, Dan, hey, Kim, to everybody who was there. And Diamond sees that. Mm. The power of knowing people's names, there is no greater HR tool on the planet. Mm. And, and I write in the book, and this is from years of experience, if people aren't worth knowing their names, you shouldn't be in HR, mm. period. Because we were given a name for a reason. You know, <laughs> doggone it. And it, forget that I can't remember. It's you choose not to remember. You think other things are more important. And honestly, remembering someone's name, 
uh, I was in Boy Scouts for years as the Scoutmaster, and all I would have to do is say, Josh, do that for me. And Josh would run and do, run through a wall for me. Hey, Sean, do this for me. And Sean would run through a wall. But if I went, hey, new kid who just got in the troop, <laughs> you go, what? <laughs> so I taught them as leaders of their troop and their patrols. You need to know every one of your boys. You need to know who they are. You need to know where they come from. You need to know where they go to school. It's important. It's important. It's important. And then, you know, you just model it. And now I know when I meet them, they tell me all the time, they go, Mr. Brown, you talk to remember names. You know how many names they know? And they'll start listing all these people's names. It's got such power and it's so simple. But I had something that I found recently that Martin Scorsese said, simple is hard. Mm. We make everything so difficult in HR. I can't remember names. Really? If you can't remember names, how in the world can you do the rest of what human resources is? Or to your point earlier, how can you be a business person if you're refusing to remember something that simple? Hmm. Uh, as for Tom, oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've been in, I wish more HR people were realistic about how people really talk because people are more coarse than we choose to be. And I am not a coarse person, but I'm around people that use all kinds of colorful language, all kinds. And I've had HR people go, oh my, oh, oh my, oh, oh. And I know. If you were sitting in a room with me, you're saying those same nasty things. You're just not cussing. That's the only difference. So Tom was a cusser and he, oh my gosh, he just lit me up. But what happened was no one paid attention to him or valued him for what he did. He had been with the company for, gosh, almost 20 years, mm. packing boxes. That was his job. And that was his job every day. And so when he made the point about he was a bowler and I challenged him on it and I said, well, I bet you're not very good. <laughs> oh. That, that lit him up like a Christmas tree. And he was like, I'll show you. And I was like, that's exactly what I wanted to do. We don't take enough interest to find out that, you know, I'm, I'm not a bowler. I like bowling. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's important to him. And I don't know why we don't take the time to go, well, I'm not in art. Well, are you interested in art? I'm not into music or I don't like bluegrass. Well, they like it. I think we make, again, things way too hard and way too programmatic instead of just getting to know people as people yeah that was uh that was a fantastic story because you actually asked him what do you do outside of work yeah and he's like what are you talking about you know like yeah tell me what do you do you know and i bowl i'm like that was, that was so fantastic the last thing i had on here from hr in person before i get into hr rising is you said every single uh company struggles with two things and that's communication and training I thought that was like right on target. Uh, so um, yeah, HR on purpose. You definitely want to, you definitely want to pick that up. What I love about that book is just the stories because it helps us connect. And, you know, you talked about uh, remembering names, you know, I, I, I went to a Dale Carnegie class years ago and it, you know, he said, uh, people's names are the sweetest sound they'll ever hear. Like when you said my name, I felt myself smiling. <laughs> yeah. It just felt good. I'm like, yes, that's, so right. Yeah. Well, what's funny is it's, it's just like Bruce, you're like, oh, that's me. I got it. We, we don't know as much as we think we do, but we know our names. And if you want to try this out to your audience, learn the names of little kids. It blows their mind. Because when you come and go, hey there, Sharon, she'll go, oh, how in the world did you, who, who are you? And it just it blows their mind. And we forget that when children grow up, they become our employees. So if it's important to remember a child's name, it's as important to remember an adult's name. Well, that was, uh, like I said, uh, HR on Purpose, Developing Deliberate uh, People and Passion. But, but this new book, HR Rising, I, I got to tell you, I am three-fourths of the way through it, but I've got so many notes. Uh, but the tagline is from ownership to leadership. And I was like, immediately that just caught my attention. Um, and then you had a mutual friend write the forward in this book, uh, yeah. Jennifer McClure. She is the, oh man, she's so much. Uh, she's a CEO of Unbridled Talent. She's got a podcast, Impact Makers. Uh, she's a speaker, a coach. She, she is Disrupt HR. Uh, just an amazing, amazing person. Why did, why did you pick, um, I'm, I'm just curious, why did you pick Jennifer to write you forward? I have a fun Jennifer McClure story. Uh, it goes back to remembering names. 
Jennifer was well known in Cincinnati as one of the most prominent executives in the area. And she was very well known before I got well known. And I hate even saying that, honestly, because I don't get it. But I've run a round table here in the city for 20 years. And I heard she was in HR, so I invited her. And she said, uh, I can't make it, and I can't do this, and uh, well, I'd, I'd love to come, and, you know, all legitimate stuff, not a shot. And, and the, Jennifer knows if I tell this story, I tell it all the time. Uh, in her Impact Makers podcast series, which is just amazing, she talks about how she lost her job, and she left her job, and had no network whatsoever. Well, she came to me to the place I used to work at before here, so it's been golly 20 plus years ago that she came and she says hey i uh i keep going out and i hear your name all over the place <laughs> and i said yeah that's cool cool and so she comes to meet me she says and she's all formal and she and she's not really that formal she was at the time she's like so i have you know here's my agenda da, da, da. and i said you know i've been asking you to come from to a meeting for five years and she says what i said i've been inviting you to come to the round table for five years so i've just been waiting for you now we get to meet and we became fast fast friends and she's always been a wonderful person she just didn't understand the power of what networking really means now she does she talks about it and she lives it uh, so with somebody who is so dear to me and I you know I helped found disrupt HR with her uh, we've been on the speaking circuit together and she's here in town uh, I, I learned so much from her so I thought you know what can I turn this back around? When you came to me and I got you connected, could I ask you to do this for me? And I've been wanting her to write. Uh, she's very good. When she used to write her blog all the time, boy, powerful stuff. So I said, since you haven't written your book yet, I'm going to give you a start. Can you write this? And then she wrote the foreword and blew me away. She's an amazing person. Uh, just absolutely amazing. I was actually... You know, I've been speaking quite a bit and I was stuck on what I want to speak about. And I had a conversation with her and all of a sudden the light, she, she like just turned on the light for me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that yeah. was, she was, it was so good. No, that, that's fantastic. I appreciate you sharing that. Well, well let's talk about HR rising. Um, I mean, you already had a book. You, it's a best selling book. Why HR rising? Well, two things. Uh, Matt Davis, who is the publisher I work with at Sherm. Uh, gave me a call. Matt and I have been really close. Uh, you know, ironically, I was the first book at Sherm that Matt published. He has been a publisher for years, but the first project they put on his desk was mine. And when I talked to him, he said, so, hi, I'm Matt Davis, blah, 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 business, business, business. And I said, so, uh, how's it going? He goes, what? I said, how you doing? What's Sherm like? You like working there? Have they really done good with your onboarding? He says, who are you? And I went, no, no. I said, we know each other before I do anything with you. Because if mm. you don't want to know me, I don't want to work with you. Mm. And we are tight. Mm. And uh, during the time that I've known Matt, he got married to Justine. They have a dog. It's all this cool people stuff. And now we talk just like you and I are talking as friends. Yeah. So after HR on Purpose fortunately did so well, he called and says, hey, feel like another book? And I go, well, I have some ideas. He goes, why don't you give it a shot? Let's see what happens. And uh, here's the, the terrible thing. And when I say this, authors are going to scream and yell at me. The first book took me a year to write. And uh, it was not hard. It just hard to focus with life and all kinds of stuff going on. I wrote uh, the second book in a month and a half. Mm. And uh, it just flew. I sat down and sat in my basement. My wife was kind, like, you need to go write. <laughs> so I'd go downstairs, turn on music, turn on lava lamps, and go. Uh, the reason it came out so easily was um, the first one was trying to say HR people need to own who they are and what they do and quit apologizing for it. Mm -hmm. We're in the best profession there is. We get to impact people's lives every single day. How can that not be the best profession? So if we would own what we do and quit apologizing, well, now how do you lead? It's the next step. So this isn't a sequel. This is an evolution. This is a, if you own what you do, how do you lead from where you are? Again, not a new concept. Millions of people have written about this. But HR people choose not to lead. HR people choose to follow and solve. Mm. And I think it's much better to lead 
the movement in your company, especially the people side of the business. And what we've learned, it was interesting, in the pandemic, I don't know if you've noticed this, everybody says, man, it's a people issue. Mm. Well, no kidding. You know, <laughs> people's families are affected. Uh, hospitals, the, the mental well-being and emotional well-being of everybody who's gone through this, the loss. It's amazing. But you're like, everything's a people issue. Mm. It just took a pandemic for us to notice it. So uh, I even talked to our CEO, who's an amazing guy, amazing guy. And I said, isn't it amazing that we came together for a pandemic and when there's a fire, but wouldn't it be great if we did that to perform as well? And he says, huh. Hmm. And I went, and that's my job. If you can get, be an HR person, you can make somebody go, huh. And then we stop them and think, you're leading. You know, you're, you're trying to move the organization forward. I'm not trying to make HR better. I want the company to be better. Mm. The company can only be better if the people are taken care of. And I truly believe, to the bottom of my heart, Bruce, companies that are people-centric and own it, and they believe it, not this best places to work hoo-ha, but they're truly people-centric, they will be relevant. Companies that choose not to be people-centric may have their time, but they will not last. Yeah, I think you're right on there. I will say that coming out of the, we're still in this pandemic. Of course, we're recording and this is going to play in March of 2021. Uh, but we figured out how to navigate through it. And we're eventually going to get on the other side of this. I don't know if there's ever been a better opportunity for leaders that are serving HR to be able to create and, and just start that movement or keep that movement going exactly what you're talking about exactly what you're talking about i want to i want to touch on uh, one of the uh, one of the chapters of, of the book uh so so when i had a conversation with jennifer uh the, the epiphany the light that went on was i spent 10 years in operations management um hr was part of my uh, responsibility and then i moved over to the sales and marketing side and when I was talking to her, I'm talking about leadership, I'm talking about relocation, I'm talking about all the, and she said, Bruce, you're, you're a sales leader. And one of the things that HR professionals have a hard time doing, many of them have a hard time with getting buy-in, selling. And, and I was like, man, you are so right. So I, I went to the drawing board and I said, okay, what are the five strategies that you need to have to get buy-in from the C-suite? And the number one, the number one is building trust. That's number one. And uh, a lot of people have a hard time. They try to skip that step and go right to their agenda because building trust takes a long time because you have to build relationships. Build mm -hmm. But you had a chapter uh, about trust versus credibility. Talk a little bit about the importance of trust um, as a leader. I think it's imperative. And, and what I wrote about was, I can build credibility and therefore I will get trust. Mm -hmm. If I'm seen as credible by somebody, they'll go, hey, I trust that person. If I don't have credibility with somebody else, which is in turn a relationship with that person, an intentional relationship, they, they can't trust you. They won't know how to, or they'll think the worst. So uh, credibility takes investment of time, period. So you are worth my time. And a great example, Kevin, who was here before, oh, after he passed, I talked to the staff and one of the, one of the administrative people who I adore, and she's been here again, 25 plus years. She says, you know, he won't tell stories with me anymore. I love to tell stories with him. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know what? I'll try to start talking stories with you. And I already had, but we did it more. And she's like, that's great. Now, I know that I have, by spending time and listening to stories and telling stories and sharing and giving, she is somebody I can go to today and say, I need this from you. And I'm an executive. So it's not a matter of her getting a time with me in front of me to push her agenda. It's me taking time to give her value in what she does and what her life's like so that when I need her, she can be the amazing, talented person she already is. HR people, if they would treat their executives as people first, mm. humans, and take the time to invest in them just as much as they invest in their family and friends and children, they'd be amazed 
how much more credibility they have at the C-suite level. Amazed. Because now they're like, gosh, Bruce takes an interest in me. Mm. Bruce cares on what I'm doing. And I know this is a repeating message of what I'm saying, but what's funny is people choose not to do it because they think the things matter far more than that. I need people to trust me, but I have to earn that through my behavior. Mm. Not from the, you need to trust me. I'm, nope. <laughs> so what you're saying is uh, when you first meet someone, they have credibility. They may not have trust. Right. They have credibility. Now all of a sudden you're watching to see, are they going to build a brand that says, hey, I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. Yes. I'm going to build a brand that um, shows my positive attitude, uh, my caring, uh, all of those traits that eventually leads to that trust. And, and I think the biggest part of trust and credibility, the thing that ties all together is consistency. Mm. So you can't say, I'm a positive person. And then <laughs> down the hall, they see you losing your mind and, and, and being negative and tearing everybody down. It doesn't mean that you don't have bad days. It doesn't mean you don't have negative right. thoughts. It doesn't mean that you don't get angry. Those are natural human things. But you can't say, I'm the go-getter. And over here, you're like, I am the tear downer. And what happens is, uh, we had a good conversation. Uh, one of my operations guys and I had this conversation. He says, man, I'm tired of being around this one guy because everything is wrong. Mm. I said, have you told him? And he says, can I do that? And they said, let's try it. And so he goes, hey, I really love working with you. But man, is everything wrong? And he goes, well, well. And, he says, and it was because that's how he found value in what he did taking what he perceives as wrong, making it better. Instead of saying, we're doing well, how can we improve from there? Organizations won't buy it. It's amazing. Or, the entire organization structures are built on everything's effed up, therefore, yeah. and it's like instead of saying, we're doing well, here's some real gaps, how can I move that forward? I said, you need to get in front of him and be more intentional with him. And he did it. And they had the best conversation they've had in a while. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love that story because I've heard, uh, and I've experienced this too, where, uh, you know, I, I might have done something and the person that I've been working with takes it personally. Sure. And all of a sudden they, they won't talk to me and now I don't talk to them. And it's like, it just keeps on building a bigger divide. And you're just saying, Hey, look, just go hit it head on. Have that conversation. Right. Well, here's a new thing I'm throwing out there. You're the first person to hear this. Ooh. You need like you need like music. Uh, one of the things I'm working on here in the organization is I'm trying to, to, to dispel the myth of silos. Mm. It comes back to trust and credibility. When companies say they have silos, and I've been the first person to say it, I've had it in presentations. You know, destroy the silos, and it's re legit. Here's what I've come to terms with: I don't think silos exist. I think lack lack of relationships exist. Mm -hmm. If I don't have a relationship with you, I will make you a silo or you will make yourself a silo. I will avoid you. I will work around you. So the key to breaking down silos is if I have a relationship with you, which is appropriate and healthy, silos won't exist. So we have to quit trying to break down silos and we need to start developing relationships. So I think it's right there. That's gold stuff to work on, at least in my place. And yeah. uh, I think it's going to work. I, I agree with you. I think people just need to remember that all of this takes time, though. It, you can't sure. do it in a day, right? But you right. can start in a day. Yes. Yeah. I, when you were talking earlier about leadership, I wish HR people would understand you should go home just beat to death. <laughs> Emotionally exhausted. You should go, God, that was a day. <laughs> it's 75 conversations and it drained me to death. I would go, that's a good day, man. That's, that's, that's a, a wonderful day. day. <laughs> You know, but, but they don't. We go home and get all worried about what we're not doing or this didn't get done on my to-do list. When I, when I go home, I'm like, oh, man, I talked myself to death today. It was a good day. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man, exhausted. Be exhausted when you get home from all those conversations. I love it. What about, um, talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned uh, there was another story in there, and that was about, uh, developing talent. And I believe the chapter was called, I see it in you. 
And uh, I think it was around uh, your, you just mentioned uh, Cub Scouts or Cub Master yeah. Yeah. and a lady named Janet. Yeah. And I just talk a little bit about that because uh, you mentioned in your very first book, one of the challenges is uh, communication and develop and training. Right. And so, and now here you are talking about developing talent. Talk a little bit about that and the importance of that, because I think that's a big challenge in most organizations. Well, what's funny is if you're involved in anything outside of work, because right? in work, you can get pushed off to the side. You can put your hand up and say, I want to volunteer. or I want to take on something. And organizations can choose to take you on or not. They can overlook you, all kinds of different reasons. You know, personalities, junk, drama, politics. You go into a volunteer organization, if you show interest, they're like, ha ha, I'm going to get that one. And they're going to be in charge of something. And, it's, and I've been that way, Bruce. Every time I go somewhere, they're like, hey, we're tapping that guy. <laughs> but what's funny is Janet didn't come ask me to be something. Because when, when she taught me this, if I ask you, you have the opportunity to say no. And you will. Because you're like, oh, man. I don't see that. Uh, I'm going to pass this time. And it happens constantly. In every, forget the organization, civic, school, church, you name it, politics. If you give somebody the option to say no, that's the first thing they'll say. Because their head goes, I'm, this is going to be too much of a commitment. I'm going to lose my life. Ah, it all goes ugly. She came up and says, you know what? You showed a lot of interest. I said, yeah, I said, I'm excited, man. My son wants to be in Scouts. I didn't have that good of an experience in Scouts, but if he wants to be in, I want to be there with him because I want to be a good dad. She goes, you know what? Uh, I see you being a dem leader. <laughs> and I said, ah, all right. Well, what's a dem leader? And then she tells me the whole thing, and here's the commitment. She says, I, I want you to give it a try because you know what? I, I know you're going to be successful in doing this. Mm -hmm. Now, I would said, so she was self-affirming, mm -hmm. stroked the ego, and you got to be honest about it. You're like, hey, someone saw that. I mean, that's kind of cool. <laughs> you might be a goofball, but they're going to try you out. And so she tried that. And I was like, this is great. Well, all of a sudden, I had, you know, eight little boys coming in there to be my five-year-old Tiger Scouts. And it was great. And then I was able to go to another dad and go, hey, you know what? I really love that your son's in our den. I I'd love you to be my assistant because I, I see that in you. Uh, you I could be a great it. assistant. And he goes, you know what? I could be a great assistant. I'm like, this is amazing. So all my way through Scouts, everybody did that. Now, it might be something that Scouts teaches. I don't know if we just picked it up in our little neck of the woods, but we never asked somebody if they could do something. We said, this is what I see in you. And organizationally, if we would do that better and we say, hey, David, I see you're doing really well in purchasing you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to see you take on supply chain as well as materials acquisition. So I want you to do the front end where you're getting all the vendors in line, but I really need you to arrange this so that our supply chain is taken care of. You know what? I see that in you. It would change how development's done. You'd never do a performance review again because you're affirming and lifting and trying people out. You're doing the same thing, but it's much more proactive and positive and it works. It works in spades and spades and spades. And you'll have people who never would have stepped up get that chance. Now, the big key in all this from an HR perspective is you have to understand if you have biases or if you have uh, areas where you're overlooking people, but that's on you. Mm. So you have to make sure that people are inclusive. You have to make sure people are diverse. You have to make sure people are given an opportunity in an equitable way so you don't always choose the same people that you like. Mm. So... Um, we also went to people that we said, we're not going to go to that person for the treasurer of the committee. We're going to have them be the campsite coordinator because, man, they'll do it. And I'll give you my best example. My wife and I are completely opposite, completely. As extroverted as I am, she is not. And I love that about her because, gosh darn it, we make a good pair. And I said, you know what? I need somebody to coordinate all the badges because in a Boy Scout, you earn all these patches. And these kids do all this work. And you need somebody who's really organized and detail-oriented. And that is not me. But my wife kills it. So I went up to her and I said, you know what? I need you to be the advancement chair. She says, I don't want to talk in front of me. I did not say that. But her mm -hmm. fear came up first. And that's what happens. Your fear comes first. And my thing is, cool, we won't do that. But I want you to do this. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm going to have you learn from Leslie. So you're not doing this new, but Leslie served her time and she did an amazing job. She, but she wants to move on to be with her boys who are getting their Eagle Scout. She thinks she'd be a great person because she sees you being the next advancement to you, chair. She sees it in you. She goes, she does. I said, she does. Mm. And my wife, who never wanted to volunteer, became an amazing advancement chair, reshaped the system, made it work better. So when she handed it off after our son became an Eagle Scout, that the next person walked into it naturally. Mm. Think how easily that would happen in organizations if we chose to develop people that way. Folks, get write that down. <laughs> I see it in you. Oh, that is like, that is part like I read it and I was like, I'm writing that down. I'm going to talk to Steve about that. That's powerful. And then you just amplified it. That was, that's uh that, that, that is so, so good. And I, I'm with you. Um, I, I got a few more things I want to talk to you about, but uh, b before we leave HR rising, was there any particular chapter or anything that stood out or, or you're getting feedback from that, that you want to share from it? Personal story. Uh, my father passed away in 2020. Oh. And uh, before he passed away, my father was diabetic, couldn't see. And uh, the opening story in the book is about a, a very challenging father-son situation. So it had a sledgehammer that, in it, didn't it? <laughs> that's right. Uh, but the thing that meant the most was, uh, and what I've heard from people yeah. is uh, the stories resonate with people. And I've always been somebody who said, you tell a story and people learn. Not mm -hmm. take a storytelling class. Tell stories. Share experiences because people learn from experiences far more than they do just a list of stuff. So uh, I got to read him the story. Mm. And so when I read it to him, because he couldn't read it, he couldn't see it. Okay. So I read it to him. We laughed. I was crying because I'm a big, mushy baby. And when I got done, he says, yeah, that's not how it happened. <laughs> we howled and we laughed. And my mom was there. She's like, it did too happen that way. And we're just having a good old time. I, I'm very touched by when I hear from people about the emotional tie they find to both books. Mm. And if you can connect with somebody emotionally, you can do amazing things because they've allowed you to come into their lives, allowed you to come into their heart, and then you can reshape and learn together. So, and I've heard that from the stories that I've written. And uh, that, so I don't have a particular chapter, but to know that I've made an emotional tie with people means the world to me. I got to tell you, man, my heart is full right now. That, that's, uh, that's incredible. And I, I, I connected with that story. And uh, uh, I just, uh, what, an, what an honor to be able to read it to him and like live that, like in that moment um, yeah. before his passing. So I'm so sorry about that. And I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, that means sure. a lot. I know uh, the listeners and, and viewers are going to get a lot out of this uh, so much. Hey, I want to ask you a little bit about volunteer leadership. Uh, you mentioned the story earlier about Jennifer being executive and not getting out. And I, I see that a lot. Everybody's busy. We're all busy, right? Busy, busy, busy. But you found a way to, to volunteer like myself and others, um, uh, in, in particular with the, the SHRM organization from a local level to state level to regional to now national SHRM. Um, I would just love for you to share, you know, why is volunteering important to you? Two things. One, you will put your time towards what's important to you. So I'm not here to prescribe what you should or shouldn't put your time toward. However, where you invest your time, that's where you show value. And I was one of these people who used to tear down the chapter, like a lot of people. Oh, it's nothing but a bunch of vendors. Oh, it's not. Rah, 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 rah. And I'd never been to a chapter meeting, by the way. <laughs> but but I heard all the all all the you know nasty stuff and it was more fun to talk about the nasty stuff and i had a person literally pin me to the wall who said hey instead of complaining about it do something about it mm. and so i said all right i'll take your challenge because i'm that kind of guy man you're gonna punch me in the head i'm coming and i but it was it was very very nice she was saying you know it was a it's a, a very direct way of making me accountable instead of allowing me just to wallow in being awful and it's funny this was before I was, hey, everything's positive. And I'm a positive guy. But she caught me in a bad part. She nailed me with it. And I appreciate her for it. She's an mm. amazing, amazing HR person. But she says, I'm tired of you tearing down something I care about. Figure it out. So I jumped in. And uh, this is why I think it's valuable to volunteer in your profession. One, how can you make your profession 
better if you're not involved in your profession. I don't know how you can do it. Um, I've had only good experiences in the midst of ups and downs through that whole time. Mm -hmm. I've been volunteering now for 20 plus years and I don't plan on stopping until they tell me I can't do it anymore. <laughs> uh, but the thing that's amazing is it's opened up incredible doors professionally, incredible doors into making my organization better by being uh, connected externally, I can make my internal processes better because other people are doing this better than we are. Mm. So, so instead of trying to always create and being very insular, I learn from others and bring mm. in components. And what we talk about here is we La rosa everything. Just like you do it at your place, you know, you, you make it fit your culture. So I might hear a great development model and we say, okay, cool. And then just like a pizza, we La rosa it and make it work. If I'm not connected externally, how can I ever learn that? And I'm not expecting others to do it. Uh, now, the difference is in my staff, my staff, I expect them to be involved at the level that they choose to be. And I will support that, not just from a financial standpoint, but from a time standpoint. Because the thing that's more important is giving people the bandwidth to give their time outside of themselves. So when I interviewed with Kevin 15 years ago, to come to La Rosa's, here are my two demands. I said, I want to be integrated throughout the organization. I don't want to be a silo in HR. And I want to keep my external commitments because I've worked too hard to have them go away. And he said, that's why we want you. And I went, mm. well, I'll be dipped. I don't know about that. <laughs> and I'll be, I'll be honest, I had somebody, when you mentioned earlier, we talked about mentors. Great mentors open doors. Great mentors don't correct. Mm. And all Kevin did was open doors. When I came to him and said, hey, I was, I was uh, asked to ta testify in front of Congress. He goes, how cool is that? Mm. Not, well, what do you mean? What, how, <laughs> what's that mean? What's going on? What are they asking the commitment for? Yeah, that'd be cool. Why don't you do that? Hey, I'm thinking about writing a book. He goes, neat. What's it about? And I said, you know, HR, and it's going to have stories. He goes, oh, that'd be great. I'd love to see that. Mm. So he was always opening doors. All of the things I've been allowed to do locally, regionally, nationally, globally now is because I had someone who said, that has value, and I know that you will bring it back into our organization. We never had a formal ROI meeting. I didn't have to bring back my five points of what I learned from Bruce <laughs> Waller at the Dallas Sherm Conference, all that hoo-ha stuff. Yeah. It was an expectation that if I was involved externally, I should bring that back to make the job and the company better. It was just a given. So um, re it was funny. Uh, I want to say early 2019, he says, yeah, I love that you're involved. I go, thanks, man. I appreciate that. He goes, but you know what? You don't bring any new ideas anymore. I went, what? He says, you're becoming too much like us. I'm really disappointed in you. So I went, what? And, that, and it, the last thing I want to do was disappoint him. He says, yeah, so glad you're involved because we don't learn anything from you. And I went, oh, my gosh. It was just like punching me in the head again. I had lost sight that I had become so used to working here that all the great connections and people mm -hmm. I know around the world, instead of, again, being fresh, energetic, and learn from them and bring that inside, I just kind of got used to it. So it was a great reminder to say, mm -hmm. make sure it constantly adds value. I absolutely believe you can do that through SHRM. I think you can do it through the local chapter. I think you can do it at the national level. And when you see things that are wrong, and there are things that are wrong, let me just be upfront. Because there are tons of people who want to pick and choose, and there are some things where we've made a mistake, just like every other organization. So hmm. get involved, make a difference. And I think you'll do a great in it. That, that's so powerful. There's so much. <laughs> I, uh, I wrote down so many different things. First of all, um, I wrote down great mentors, open doors. Oh man, folks, write that down right now in your journal. And then I, I love the uh, La Rosa Fi. I'm going to have to start thinking Armstrong a uh, <laughs> something like that. Um, but one thing you said, uh, and I got to experience this at the Sherm and back in the day when we all got to attend a conference yes. uh, in Las Vegas, you were speaking at the uh, Sherm National Conference, and you made a comment 
and I, I've shared that with so many people since then, and, and is this, uh, when you talk about volunteer leading, um, uh, networking in general, getting outside, you said everyone should have at least five people they know outside the workplace just to talk life with, right? Just to talk about different uh, things with. And so uh, as you talk about that, now I know why that's important, not only to you, but your team, because you know um, they're, they're going to have somebody not only to talk to, but to grow with. I call this a growth day. So when I go to a Texas Sherm meeting or a Dallas HR event, or I'm on this podcast, this is my growth day. Like I'm going to learn uh, from the person I'm talking to. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. That's fantastic. Let me, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you talk about leading your, your team, uh, but I want to talk about leading Steve just real quick. Uh, I would love for you, if you could share, what is a daily practice or do you have a daily practice that you do every day uh, that helps you keep on track? I do. Uh, it's funny. My brother and my sister-in-law introduced me to this thing called Twitter. And when I first saw it, I was like, this is senseless and stupid. And I do not care what Bruce had for lunch. And what, <laughs> it's all nonsense. And when I finally realized that it's a chance to have a quick conversation with somebody, a quick conversation mm. with somebody, mm. I said, I will make sure that I check in on people who are choosing to be connected to me. That has led to amazing things. So every day I will spend a handful of minutes and not hours and hours and hours. Because mm -hmm. people go, you're out there all the time and you're everywhere. I go, no, no, no. It's very intentional. Mm -hmm. I know where to look, what to look, and who to touch base with. And I'll make sure to reach out and say, saw your stuff, talking to you. How's it going? Share this blog. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, Jane Harrison, who's from the UK, uh, Jane and I have never met. And I hope to someday, but we have not met. When I went over there, we didn't get a chance to meet. She wrote in this group that called the HR Pub Quiz, and I'm on a pub quiz with all these people from the UK and some from the States. We have a great old time. We laugh and laugh and laugh. It's all people stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a pub quiz. She put on our group, Who Talks Every Day? Hey, I'm doing this Wellbeing Wednesday. I appreciate you if you share it. Well, okay. So since I'm fortunate enough to have people listen to what I say, which I don't understand at all, if I can take that and elevate the good work that she's doing, that fills my day. You talk about mm. growth. I need to fill my bucket by showing the good work of others. And that's just who I am. So I sent it out there and I said, Jane, you've got to be there. And, and it is. I read her posts every Wednesday for Wellbeing Wednesday. And it is fantastic stuff. I had people who aren't as connected with me, they say, I was looking for a well-being post, Steve, thank you so much, and now they're gonna be using that organization. Another person said, man, I was waiting for a well-being thing, I'm gonna use it. And all I did was say, follow what Jane does. I, I believe in sharing the work of others. I love that, a couple of things there. Number one, little things lead to big things. Uh, no question about that. But one thing I've noticed about leaders uh, on this podcast is that they all have a common thread, and that is uh, they have a system. And so, sure. you, you know, getting on Twitter every day, being intentional, you see, you use that word a lot. And, and I like that. Well, I've got one more, uh, I've got one more question um, before we get into the very last part, uh, Accelerate. And, and the question is around, I always like to ask, is there any advice that you've been given? It could have been given by a family member, a friend, someone at work, any advice you've been given that you, it was so good you find yourself often sharing that? Uh, my father, who's technically my stepfather. That's another long story. But he always said, value the work that other people do hmm. for what they do. So if a person is gifted at fixing cars, value that he can fix a car. Not that you don't know how to. Uh, the people at my bakery who stretch dough, it, when they stretch dough, it takes care of people eating as a family and connecting those dots, but value what they do. The executive who makes strategic decisions that move a company forward to improve the bottom line, value what that person does. And uh, don't discredit it. Value it for who they are and what they do. That's absolutely gold, man. I appreciate you sharing that so much. Listen, the time always goes by so fast. I've just got a real quick 
Uh, it's time to accelerate episode, just some fun facts. Uh, so I'm going to ask you real quick, uh, book or podcast? Book. Book. Maybe HR Rising? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I love podcasts. They're great conversations with books, man. You can go back and forth and yeah. back and forth and dig and dig and dig. I'm with you, man. I, I, I love underlining and, and, and marking the pages and uh, love that. Uh, what are you most grateful for? Oh, gosh. That's tough. I'm grateful that uh, I had a fine person who I've now been married to for 31 years. <laughs> My introverted wife asked me out. And uh, without her, I wouldn't be able to do anything. I love that, man. I appreciate you sharing that. That's fantastic. Well, you know, we, we've all been through a incredibly difficult time, 2020. Absolutely incredible. But now here we are in 2021, into the first quarter. We're out of the gates. What, what are you excited about, like, ahead in 2021? Uh, I'm excited that what I learned in 2020 wasn't all bad. Hmm. I, I am not that person who goes, oh, I'm so glad that year's over. I learned so much last year that I never learned before that people can perform in different ways. Huge. That people need to be connected and collaborate. Huge. That we are people-centric and everything is a people issue. Huge. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Were there difficult times? Yes. Uh, People talked about being agile and adaptable, and no company was, not one. Well, all of a sudden, ta-da, you better be agile and adaptable. Yeah. And so I think there's things to take away from a difficult valley to learn from instead of complaining about how awful it was. It was. There were awful parts. But, you know, uh, my wife and I like to watch some of the old historic shows. You know, I don't want to live in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Yikes. You know, people were afraid that they'd die because they woke up. I mean, we, right. we are so fortunate, and yet yeah. we complain about everything that's going wrong. Social justice, it's been so far overlooked for so long, and shame on us that it has. But we should learn from that and move forward and say, we were wrong. We were off base. Equity, gee, that's a new concept. Oh, I mean, there's so many good things. The challenge is, are we going to move forward mm. or sink back? Because when people say, I want to go back to the way the things they, they were, I do not, mm. ever. Mm. And that's not because it was a tough year. There's no reason to always stay where you are. You always should be moving forward. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I, I, I agree 100%. I think there's just uh, incredible, incredible opportunity ahead for all of us. And so now's the time and yes. uh, to rise up, right? Uh, okay, got two more questions. Um, what energizes you? People, people, and music. Uh, and I'm music. a music freak. I, I, I have music on constantly. It's killing me having my iPod off right now because I'm like, I need music right now. Uh, uh, but people fascinate me, man. I mean, I can't. It's funny I, when people say I'm a people person. I'm like, ah, I don't think you are. I, I think I think you're a I like certain people for certain times person. Mm. Everybody fascinates me, uh, even the ones that just challenge the crud out of me. Uh, I love being around humans all the time. Yeah. yeah, no, that's fantastic. I can tell. I can tell. This is energizing. Okay, this is the final question. Probably, Steve, it's probably my favorite question to ask. And the question is, Steve's 10 years older. He's around the corner knocking at your door, and you're going to go answer that door. What's he going to say to you? That's a great question. I think he would have said, could you have reached more people? Mm. And I don't know if I could, but I think the answer is, you know, could you have genuinely reached more? Because uh, even as, as much as I choose to be a connector and be out there and be intentional all the time, there are people that are still missing that mm. want to be connected and known and valued. And I, it, it kills me that there are people that I can't, find and go, ha, come here. I love you. Let's go. Uh, 
it, you know, I hope that's not the case, but I bet that would be part of it. I love that. It reminds me of the uh, tagline at Nike. There is no finish line for connecting. Right. <laughs> it doesn't say for connecting. I, I, <laughs> I added that part. Oh my gosh, this has been so much fun. Uh, Steve, I, I appreciate you coming on the show and just sharing your perspective, your, your wisdom with us. I'm excited about your new book, HR Rising. And, and of course, your old book, <laughs> HR oh. on Purpose, which is fantastic. I'll make sure to put those in the show notes. Uh, if someone wanted to connect with you, uh, what would be the best way that they would connect with you, Steve? Two things, Twitter, at S Brown, HR, there's an E on the end of Brown, or LinkedIn. But understand, and you know this, and we know this about each other, uh, if you connect with me, it's on. Uh, but my thing is this, I'm going to be in your life and I want you to be in mine. Just to connect online, it, it doesn't have a lot of value. Uh, just to be there in each other's lives has all the value in the world. That's so great. I'll, I'll put that in the, uh, in the show notes as well. Listen, man, you are driving in the leadership lane. I, I appreciate you. Hey, if you're listening to this podcast and, and you enjoy this, reach out. Uh, connect with Steve. Uh, if you get an opportunity, post a, a review. Let us know how we're doing on, on the podcast. And I just appreciate this community. Share it with others. And Steve, I just want to say this has been energizing. I'm grateful for our partnership, uh, get, you know, over the last 10 years. Um, and uh, most importantly, I'm grateful for our friendship. So thanks again for coming on to the show. Thanks much for having me. I love having you being here, Bruce. Love it, love it, love it. You bet, man. Can't wait to share it. Talk to you later. See you. Man.